Thank you all for coming. I, I see we've had a pretty good turnout. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Dr. Jason Wong. Uh, Jason is a human factor scientist with the Naval Undersea Warfare Center. He received his PhD from George Mason University in human factors and applied cognitive psychology in 2009. Um, and today he'll be giving us a talk about whether our thoughts deceive us, uh, human factors and design. Please welcome Jason. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me, and thanks for such a great turnout today. Um, as Ricardo mentioned, uh, my name is Jason Wong. Uh, I work with uh, the Naval Undersea Warfare Center, pretty much doing uh, what we call human systems integration, but essentially human factors on submarines, which is certainly a unique environment, not one that people typically think about. Uh, but I'll be talking about some of the work that I do throughout the talk. Uh, but in the meantime, the primary focus is the, the question of whether or not our thoughts deceive us. And when I ask that question, a lot of people are like, well, what are you talking about? You know, These are my thoughts. I'm thinking them. Why would I work on deceiving myself? But it turns out that the way we think and the way our cognition operates is not always necessarily ideal. So I wanted to start off with an example. This is taken from actually a television show called Darren Brown's Mind Control, which was on sci-fi. Um, he doesn't actually control minds, but it's sci-fi. So, you know, they got to they gotta um, play, with the, play with the title. But nonetheless, I'm going to show a short video. Um, the video is not going to have sound, uh, but you can kind of get the point. Essentially, by the way, Darren Brown took this from a researcher by the name of Daniel Simons at the University of Illinois, who originally conducted this experiment. But this is a nice video showing what's happening. So the guy here is Darren Brown, and he's playing the part of a, a lost tourist in a city. He has a map and he's going to try and find someone off the street to give him directions. And then you're going to find something interesting happens. So here he goes, looking around. He finds someone and the guy starts giving directions. Then this thing happens, you know, painting comes, interrupts them. And then right off the bat, this guy, without missing a beat, guy off the street, keeps giving it. Um, keeps giving directions. So you see a couple smiles, heard a couple chuckles, but a lot of people didn't seem to notice anything interesting. So if I, this might be a little bit easier. So if you notice uh, what Darren Brown is wearing here, black shirt, uh, black sports jacket, and after the painting, yeah, different guy. <laughs> uh, wearing a white shirt, black jacket, dark hair. And of course, the guy off the street has no idea what just happened, keeps giving uh, the, the directions. So, just as another example, because someone might say, well, you know, the guy looks similar, similar hairstyles, um, as another example. Same setup here, Darren Brown talks, finds a woman off the street, she starts giving directions. Here comes the painting, and it changes from a white guy to an Asian woman. <laughs> And the woman off the street does not miss a beat. So, returning back to that question of do our thoughts deceive us? Well, to some extent, especially in this example, they most definitely do. Human cognition has its limits. And the field of human factors is, uh, the goal of this field is that it seeks to understand these limitations of our cognition, but despite these, still design usable systems. So whenever I talk about human factors and these principles, I always get this, well, a lot of this seems like common sense. And a perfect example of that, and something you're still learning in a human factors class, is that you don't use the color red unless it means something bad or something dangerous is about to happen. That's the kind of association that we have. And it seems like common sense, and it seems like something that's innate in everyone, that we wouldn't violate this principle, yet it does happen. So this is a screenshot from, um, actually, the US government um, dental and vision benefits site. So there's a separate dental plan and a separate vision plan. And this is actually off of mine. Um, I'm not enrolled in the dental plan right now. And you can see up here, it says that you are not enrolled. Not enrolled being in red, being a bad thing. I mean, that's perfectly fine. But I have terrible eyesight, so I definitely need the vision plan. And it says you are enrolled in big red text. This common sense principle of use green if it's good, red if it's bad, is violated here. It might just be that the designer was terribly lazy and didn't really care. 
but it's also entirely possible that the designer made this conscious decision to make that text red as well, violating the supposedly common sense principle. So throughout this talk, I want to talk about how we're making some of these basic mistakes, talk about some of the limits of low-level and high-level cognition, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means later on. I want to talk about how this affects design and also uh, how we can go about fixing things. So the first topic I wanted to talk about is that of visual attention. This is what I studied in graduate school, so it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, but this is what I consider a little more low-level cognition, a little more um, basic uh, cognition that we don't have as much control over. Of course, we have uh, some control over where we pay attention, or uh, yeah, the things that we pay attention to, but a lot of times we don't have uh, that conscious control. So I call it a little more low-level. But nonetheless, the concept of visual attention focuses on the fact that there's only so much stuff we can focus on at once. For example, that ridiculous noise outside <laughs> is really easy for us to focus on, and it makes it a little bit harder to focus on me or to read the text on the slides. Visual attention means that only we can only be focusing on this particular uh, stuff. And also, especially with visual attention, we have a broad area um, that's known as our visual field that we can pay attention to, but only a very small portion of that. Three angular degrees right in front of us that we actually have very good fine detail. So if we want to actually extract fine detail from, from the environment, we only have a small window in which to do so. So the big principle from this is that cluttered design is bad, and you don't want that. So a good example of having uncluttered design, since I'm speaking at Google, I have to kiss a little bit of butt, uh, but the Google homepage here is nice and clean, especially with this redesign where a lot of the stuff up top with all the different um, functionality has been taken away unless you actually move the mouse. But it's nice and clean. If you imagine you're trying to extract information, if you've never been to the Google homepage, there's only so much to look at. It's a nice uncluttered design that's very easy to pay attention to. Again, it almost seems like a common sense principle, but you have people that completely violate this. So this slide right here is actually um, a slide that we use at the government with the US Navy. If you want money for an internal project, this is the slide that you create. You fill in this template. You have the project title up top, you fill in a project description, justification, approach, all in Times New Roman 10 point font, which is barely acceptable for print, let alone a slide that goes up in front of a bunch of people trying to figure out what your project is about. It's a completely cluttered design that really doesn't make any sense, but uh, bosses say you have to use it, so we have to use it. Okay, so that's kind of a broad overview of visual attention but I wanted to talk about specific kind of sub-phenomenon of visual attention. The first being scene gist, which is exactly what it sounds, just understanding the gist of a scene, or kind of the basic, most fundamental aspect of the scene. So scene gist was actually originally um, discovered and talked about by Mary Potter at MIT back in kind of the late 60s, early 70s. So as a brief example of this, I'm gonna show you three pictures very quickly. All I want you to do is kind of just give me the gist or just remember the gist of what the picture is, and after the three, I'll ask you for what they are. Okay, here we go. Okay, so what were the pictures? What was the first one? Classroom. Classroom. Second one? Library. Library. Third one? Library. Cottage garden. Yeah, that one's a little bit harder. I kind of threw that in there to, to throw you a little bit. It's ideally a Japanese tea house, but that's, that's a lot to get out of this. But there's a cottage, there's a garden, there's the library, and there's the classroom. So what Mary Potter and her colleagues have found, it has been replicated all over, and as a brief demo I gave you, people within tens of milliseconds, a millisecond being one thousandth of a second, can figure out the gist of a scene, which is pretty impressive. A very quick flash, and you get the gist of what's going on. So this is a very useful thing, um, a very, uh, a, it's not a quirk of cognition, but it's a very good thing that we should try and take advantage of. So how can we do that with design? Well, one example of that would be through advertisements. We know, and you, know, you guys being Google, doing a lot of advertisements, people don't really stare at advertisements. They kind of look at it, and then they glance away. So this is a great place that we can use the principle of scene gist to make sure that people get the gist of an advertisement before looking away. So here's actually a bad example of this. I found this on a website, uh, maybe September, October 2008, when the election was still going on, a nice image. So what you have here is it uses, it's primarily blue, which is the color of uh, most closely associated with Democrats. 
that uses the Obama logo in big white bold text that says Senator Obama, this red button that says speak out, which is neither here nor there. And then you actually read the text. Tell Senator Obama it's not 2004. Then you read the super tiny text that says paid for by McCain Palin 2008. And you go, what in God's name were these people thinking? The principle of scene gist, the fact that you know, most people really don't care that much about politics, they might look at the ad and look away. But within that 20, 30 you know, milliseconds or half a second, typically, what are they going to get from this? They're not going to get that it was paid for by McCain Palin in 2008. They're going to get that this was an ad for Obama. So this is an example of a complete violation of scene gist, and it takes a lot of effort to actually realize that this is not an Obama ad. Okay. So moving on, um, another concept I wanted to talk about was inattentional blindness. This is a concept that was originally found uh, by, again, Daniel Simons um, and um, other researchers as well from the University of Illinois. But he has one of the most interesting demos of this. So what I'm going to show you is a video. Some of you might have seen this. This is fairly uh, popular within pop culture. So if you've seen this, no cheating, um, kind of stay, stay quiet. How many of you have seen this, by the way? Oh, God. <laughs> Okay, well, it might be worth it for the people who haven't seen it. Um, there are six people, and I'll just explain it briefly. There are six people. Um, there's the three people wearing black shirts. That's the black team. And there are three people wearing white shirts. That's the white team. They're going to be bouncing a ball or throwing a ball back and forth. Your task is to focus on the white team here, completely ignore the black team, and count how many times the ball passes between members of the white team. Okay? This video goes for... Excuse me. This video goes for about uh, 30 seconds or so. So count, focus on the white team and the number of passes that occur between members of the white team. Okay, how many did you guys count? 16, that's the right answer. How many of you that have not seen this video before notice something interesting, notice something kind of strange happening? What did you guys notice? Gorilla, guy in a gorilla suit? Who didn't notice the guy in the gorilla suit? A few people, okay, this demo totally is worth it for the people who didn't notice it. So, oops, let me come back here. So instead of counting now, just kind of pay attention to uh, just watch the video, but yeah, so up comes a guy in a gorilla suit, pounds his chest, and then walks out. So the guys, so for the guys of you who totally missed that, and for the guys, of, it's, you know, it's like, how in the world did you miss that? And for people that have seen this already, at least now you know, it still works on other people. Yeah? Yes, so in this condition, when you're focused on the white team, you tend to filter out the people uh, wearing black, and of course the gorilla is in black. Um, in this condition, I think only about 42% of people actually notice the gorilla. If you ask people to focus on the black team, so they're ignoring everything that's white, that number jumps up to about 80%. So I made it so you guys would, would miss the gorilla. I mean, an interesting part of this as well, by the way, the task that you had was what Dan Simons called the easy condition, just counting the number of passes between the team. If you make the task much harder, which is count the number of just throws and count the number of bounces. So you're keeping two different counters in your head. Um, the number of people who notice the gorilla drops uh, significantly. So even if you're paying attention to the black team, but trying to count the number of bounces and throws separately, the people that miss the gorilla or the people that see the gorilla is only about 55% or so. So that kind of illustrates this principle of inattentional blindness, where if you're paying attention to a task that's relatively difficult, then your attention is focused on that and you tend to miss other things in the environment, specifically guys in gorilla suits. So how can this um, come in handy? Well, one example that I like to talk about is that of proofreading. We've all made stupid mistakes. And this is an example from uh, Jorge Cham's PhD comics, some of you might be familiar with. The guy on the left, Mike, just submitted his PhD dissertation. And the woman uh, uh, on the right is his wife who's volunteered to go ahead and sit down and read the PhD dissertation. So
So yeah, the, it's not until uh, his wife actually sits down and reads it did she realize that he misspelled his name. But typically when we're reading important things like our PhD dissertations, you're reading for content, maybe a little bit of grammar, but you're not really focused on spelling. Microsoft Word, no matter what, is going to underline that word in red. So your attention is busy doing something else, so you're going to totally miss uh, that proofreading error. And you know, this is in comic form, but of course proofreading errors happen all the time. This is pulled off the NBC.com website, which presumably gets a lot of page views. And you see the Air Force telling him to never let, you know, never let him out of your sight. I kind of wish there was a little thing underneath that asked you to visit their website for more information. Um, but, and amusingly enough, they're talking about Air Force vigilance, which is being very vigilant, really paying attention to the task at hand. Obviously, the designer was not in the least bit vigilant when he was typing out uh, the text for this banner ad. Okay, so moving on quickly through um, the tour of visual attention is the concept of attention capture which is not quite the flip side to inattentional blindness, but it's kind of close. What this is saying is that if you're doing a task that's not especially attentionally demanding, you are likely to be distracted by other things. And um, this field is all about devoted to studying what exactly is going to distract you. So in the most basic task, what you have here on the left, or the main task is a visual search task. So once the display on the right appears, you're looking for the square amongst the circles. Pretty basic stuff. Um, but the first screen that you see is on the left, six placeholder objects telling you where the objects will eventually appear, um, and then you see the actual search display. What's unique here is, is this going to work? Yes. This new object here, where there wasn't one before, so this new object is known as um, a new object that abruptly onsets to the display, because there wasn't a little placeholder for it before, and what you find in these kinds of conditions, 25 to 30 percent of the time, the people's eyes, or the observer's eyes, move from the center of the screen to the new object, then to the target. The new object is never the target. It's always a circle. It's never the square. They never need to look at it. But 25 to 30 percent of the time, they look at it. If you ask them later, did you notice anything funny, they might say yes. If you ask them, you know, they might actually um, volunteer the information that, yeah, I noticed, you know, a new circle appear. Were you distracted by it? No, of course not. You know, I knew it was there. Why would I pay attention to it? But there's an involuntary uh, eye movement made to that object that's totally that's distracting. Of course, they can get back on task fairly quickly, but it's the distracting eye movement um, that people aren't even aware of. So the gets gets. Oops. So, uh, um, sorry. One more thing, just to briefly talk about, is that it's not just abrupt onsets of new objects that suddenly can capture your attention. An example here, and this is from my. PhD dissertation, um, where I had the visual search task, the two boxes in the middle, but the box on the outer sides is the addition of a memory task. You saw a colored disk, um, in this case a certain shade of yellow, you had to remember it. Then you saw uh, the object, so you switched to the visual search task. And here you can notice that not only is there the abrupt onset of a new object, but it's also the color that you were currently memorizing for, for the separate memory task. And what you found here is that on average about 40%, some people were as high as like 50 or 60%, their eyes would totally get distracted, look at this object before moving to the target. And then here they were just tested on which shade of yellow they had to remember, which, doesn't, well, which comes out okay on the projector. But nonetheless, there are a lot of different things and a lot of different factors that can distract us from the main task and capture our attention. In terms of design, this is really important for things like system alerts. We're always trying to alert our users to things that are very important or the to things that aren't very important, and we need to figure out how exactly do we design those. Those of you who are uh, users of OS X might have the system application installed called Growl. Are people familiar with this? See some nods? Okay. Essentially, if you get like a new instant message, a new email, or if your Xcode compile is done, or whatever, um, whatever an application deems worthy of alerting you about, a new box will appear in the upper right. So you get essentially the onset of a new object that will give you um, alerts. So you can move your eyes, you can look at it, after maybe uh, five seconds or so, the box fades away and you can go back to doing your work. This, of course, is an example where all, we've all used Windows at some point, point. we've all had these stupid boxes come up in the lower right, alerting you of whatever. You know, your trial version of Windows is about to expire, who knows what. But nonetheless, you have to move your eyes down there. Even more insidious, though, 
with these boxes is you often have to move the mouse and click on this tiny little X right here in order to close the box. Otherwise, the box itself sometimes doesn't disappear. Even worse, if you miss the box and click on the message itself, it brings up the application window, so you have to go and close that in order to get the whole thing to go away, and it's very annoying. But nonetheless, it brings into mind the fact that we need to design our alerts very carefully. If it's something really important, like you have a virus or your computer is going to explode, you probably want to interrupt their task and flash something um, right in front of their face. But otherwise, if it's not that important, maybe we can think about different alerting strategies. And there's a whole uh, lot of literature, in the, or a lot of human factors literature about um, alerts. Okay. So, yep. okay. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about how we can understand and train visual attention. Talked about the different phenomena that I want to talk about that are of particular interest. But how can we seek to understand visual attention? Well, one way to do that is we can do this through eye tracking, which is one of my personal favorites. I know that there's um, a lot of eye tracking work being done here at Google, but here's how we can apply that. Um, and here's how we're applying this at the Navy. This is a project done by uh, Helen Wright at the Navy that I got to work with uh, last summer with some of the data analysis, but dealing with people who are fire control technicians on a submarine. These are not the firemen. They don't run around with fire extinguishers. These are the people that, um, so if the sub's sitting you know, un right underwater, these are the people that localize where the different ships are at the surface, or other subs for that matter. So here's a, shipping, here's a shipping vessel, here's a fishing vessel, here's you know, a Russian boat that we might want to keep track of. So these are the guys in terms of fire control technician. It's like firing torpedoes. So um, a very important job that we want to make sure that they can do properly. So here's an experiment looking at, you know, they have a lot of tools available to them. We want to know what kind of tools um, they use that creates the best performance. So the experimental setup goes like this. In the upper left is the sonar display, sonar being the sound display. We send out sound pings, and those, that sound comes back in a certain profile, and it shows up here. Typically, that data is dealt with uh, in, with a sonar technician. Fire control people don't have access to this, but we're going to give it to them here anyways. Um, all that data comes in, gets computed through a bunch of computers, and gets uh, put up to a display in the upper right that displays the data in a slightly more friendly format. That goes into another computer that does stuff to the data, and it spits out into these two identical displays. And these are the main displays that the fire control technicians work on. And they have a geographical display here. They work with the actual pings here, and they do a bunch of other things. So essentially, what we're able to do is get um, a bunch of junior fire control technicians to come, sit down. We strapped an eye tracker to their head, and we're able to um, present them with scenarios where they actually had to localize targets in the environment, and we're able to track their eyes. So we got information that looked like this. In the upper left is a display of fixations. A fixation is when, you're, um, when you've stopped moving your eyes and you're focused on a location and you're gathering information from that place. So if I focus on a particular face and I stop there, I can fixate on that face and gather information. So each individual blue dot is a different is a different separate fixation that the fire control technician made. So you can see here, there are a lot of blue dots around, uh, around right there, very specific tools within their main display. Down here is saccade data. A saccade is essentially a very quick eye movement that occurs between fixations. So if I wanted to scan the room and look at each individual person, I'd fixate on a person, make a saccade to move to the next person, and so on. So this way, I can see how the eyes are moving through what's called a scan path and how it's gathering information in the sequence. So you can see here the faint red lines that show up kind of on the screen uh, between the individual blue dots. From this, we can find typical scan paths. And what we're able to do with this is we're able to break down some of the scan paths in a generalized manner, and we're able to correlate this with performance. So we could see that we're able to come up with a specific workflow. So they would go from this location to over here, press a button down here, then use this to, to um, inform what's going on here. And we're able to kind of make these assumptions and also interview fire control technicians about what they did to say, hey, this is kind of a best practice sort of thing of how to use this system to most accurately localize your targets, to best do your job. So this is how, by tracking where visual attention and the eyes were going, we're able to understand 
uh, kind of the thought process behind these fire control technicians. So that's kind of my favorite way of doing this, but of course there are other ways as well. I'll talk a little bit about those. In terms of training visual attention, one of the most fun ways of doing it is through first-person shooter video games. Uh, a bunch of researchers, most notably uh, early on, Green and Bavelier, um, brought in people who are novice and expert video game players, specifically those um, that were best at first-person shooter video games, so Doom, Quake, all those kinds of games. And what they found here, if you think about it too, if you've ever played these games, is that you're focused on the central point on the screen because that's where your gun is aimed, but you have guys, enemies coming at you that could be you know, way up top, way from the side, or even could be coming in pretty close, but you have to be able to detect all these guys to shoot and kill them. So what Green and Bavelier did with their expert video game players and non-expert video game players was run them through a series of basic attention tasks. So something um, up top right there, where they'd first be focused on the center, and then uh, kind of a little blip would appear on the screen. And could either be these circles here were not there, but there's a little bright dot that would appear, either close in to the center of the screen or progressively farther out. Then the screen was wiped, and they had to say, hey, where was the object? And what they found was that this dashed line is video game players and the solid line is non-video game players. They found that the video game players were consistently able to detect objects better. They had um, you know, greater capacity of visual attention to pay attention to more of the screen and were able to detect the small blip that occurred very quickly. Um, and the, the experts were better than the video game novices. So just by playing video games, also, these guys have done um, some training studies where they bring in novices and have them play hours upon hours of video games, uh, which is not a bad way to, to get your undergrad psychology credits, and then, and then test them on, on these same visual attention tasks. And you do see an improvement after hours of video game playing. So some of the work that uh, I've done at George Mason University with uh, Matt Peterson and uh, his group is that we did this with eye tracking. We brought in video, uh, experts and novices, had them play video games and track their eyes. This is some very early pilot data that we had. We're working on expanding this entire study. But nonetheless, what this says is throughout, it was only a 10 minute, um, it was a 10 minute pilot study. So they only played games for about 10 minutes. But you see that experts up top, that's a graph of fixation frequency, how many fixations they made, how many times they stopped to gather information in the world. And you see experts actually made fewer fixations than the novices did, which is the blue bar. So it's interesting that the experts actually made fewer eye movements. You think that if they're better at the game, they might make more. But that's actually explained down here with the average fixation duration. So this is how long they actually stopped to gather information. And you can see here that the experts stopped, when they did stop, they stopped for longer and gathered, and um, yeah, they stopped for longer than the novices did. So combining these two results together, what we can say is that an expert will make fewer fixations, but when they stop to make a fixation, they stay there longer, presumably because they can gather more information, which was shown by Green and Bavelier, that experts have a wider field of view, they can gather more information from a single fixation. So we're definitely working more with um, training video game players as well and seeing how their eye movement patterns change over time at George Mason. But this is definitely an interesting way to train visual attention. Okay, so I wanted to shoot. Yes, so absolutely. That you see tend to be consistent with a high yep. So that those results would probably be consistent with the hypothesis that the experts have better peripheral vision. Yes. Was that was peripheral vision measured uh, directly in any way, or does this? Was vi per excuse yeah. Me. Like, Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Um, is there any sort of like measurement of like? how good your peripheral vision is? Sure. And if so, were the experts better? To some extent, um, this task right here uh, up top can be thought of as getting at peripheral vision because your eyes are forced to stay at the center of the screen and you pre present uh, objects that are close in or farther and farther away. Okay. So you're tapping into that measure of how well can they pay attention in the periphery. Okay. Um, and expert, experts are definitely able to essentially s expand their field of view okay. or expand how much they can process in the peripheral so vision. the whole screen, about what's like percentage of the, like about what was the angle relative to the person 
like about what angle of their vision is the size of the screen? Sure. They typically, um, the screen, I don't have that off the top of my head, um, but they're sitting about 20 inches or so away for like a 19 inch screen or so. Okay. So it's, it's pretty filling. In actually the Green and Bavli studies, they have, I think they had a really large screen and people were sitting very close. So for, so for these studies, it took in a lot of their visual attention. For the studies we had, it was just a standard distance you'd sit away okay. from the monitor. Thanks. Yep, no problem. Okay. So switching gears a little bit um, to higher level cognition, something and higher level because we have more control over it generally, is uh, problem solving and decision making. Problem solving is interesting because one of the um, most interesting psychological concepts when we're trying to solve, when we're studying how people solve problems is the term called uh, perseveration, which is when we have a solution to a previously solved problem and we keep trying to apply that solution to everything. It's like we've developed a hammer and everything else looks like a nail. So an interesting book that I found um, that's relevant to software development is this book called Anti-Patterns, which is of course a play on software patterns in development, where people have written a certain uh, piece of code to solve a problem, and any new problem they come at, they keep trying to jury rig this piece of code to fit into other soft to fit into these other problems. And this is a problem to some extent. It's programmers being lazy, but of course, to some extent, it's just that we've put in all this effort, and we don't want to see this effort go to waste. We want to uh, maximize the efficiency of the effort we put into something. And of course, a lot of the time, perseveration can be a good, th or um, reusing solutions can be a good thing. But perseveration, which is when you refuse to switch away from a solution you've already found, can be a very bad thing. But we all have these kinds of problems. This is an XKCD cartoon. It's the holidays. We're all going to have to go home and fix our parents' computers, um, or else they're going to ask us for specific tech support. And this is the diagram that we all generally use. We have a problem. We're going to try and find a menu item or button that looks like what they want to do, and we're going to click it. And we're going to see if it works or not. And they have this kind of loop that goes through that we generally go through of trying a bunch of different buttons and Googling and seeing what's going to work. And that, to some extent, if you go with this for too long, you're going to be perseverating because you're going to be trying this one particular solution that's worked before on all these different problems. Thankfully, the XKCD uh, comic has kind of um, an exit clause where if you've been trying this for more than half an hour, you give up. You ask someone for help, you call tech support, God forbid, or else you just plain give up and say, yeah, we'll, we'll try something else next time. But nonetheless, you know, we want pr this behavior that we have is generally good, but we have to be aware of when we're perseverating, of when we're just trying too darn hard to make the solution fit into something else. Uh, and we have to recognize that and say, okay, kind of wipe the slate clean and start over. So this related concept of decision making is an interesting one. So what um, some experimenters did was give people two different glasses of wine, and they were told that one wine was significantly more expensive than the other wine, even though, of course, the two wines were very, very similar. I don't think they were identical, but they had similar properties. And they told them, you know, drink the wine and tell me how much you like it on a scale of one to five. Naturally, as you would expect, uh, people that people tended to like the wine that they were told was more expensive, even though it was very similar. The chemical composition um, was was very similar. What's more interesting is when they had people do this in an fMRI scanner. An fMRI scanner is able to uh, look at the brain and see which particular area bundles of neurons are active. So what you can find here, and what the researchers did, is that they image specifically what's called the orbital frontal cortex, an area in frontal cortex that's known for emotion and pleasure and kind of happiness. So what you find here is that on the x-axis you have the rating of how much they liked it. So here, when they really liked it, you can imagine here's where the expensive wines go and here's where the uh, less expensive wines go, quote unquote, more and less expensive. On the y-axis is how much activation you saw in those in uh, the orbital frontal cortex. So what you see is that as you're told it's a more expensive wine, you tend to like it more, and that area of your brain is more active. So what this is saying is that not only, you might think, you know, people you know, are kind of, um, or you might think if you're told that it's a more expensive wine, you're going to like it, but you're kind of lying to yourself that you can actually know that, you know, no, they're really the same, but because I paid more, I'm not going to get ripped off. I like this one better. But it turns out at the neural level, 
your neurons are helping to helping perpetuate this lie by saying, hey, you really do like this better on a neural level. So this is kind of the ultimate example of do my thoughts deceive me, where your brain is actually supporting these lies that you're being told that yes, you like this more expensive wine better. Okay, so real quickly, because I'm starting to run out of time, I'm talking about understanding cognition from a broader perspective, not just understanding visual attention, but how we can break down also this high level problem solving and decision making strategies that I'm talking about. So we can do this, one way we can do this is through something called task analysis which we're applying at the Navy right now. But we have a system for uh, pilots and navigators on surface ships trying to uh, navigate a giant ship. Imagine trying to parallel park a giant, um, really expensive, really heavy ship against a dock without bumping into it. It's a big task and we don't wanna just set them out to sea and say, hey, have fun. So we've built a virtual simulation of this. Here's a screenshot of that simulation. It's pretty high fidelity. They have all the physics built in. But the issue is right now that every time a student gets into the simulator, you need to have an instructor there as well giving feedback. Hey, you're going too fast. Hey, you made this turn too early. Or good job, which is only occasional that they get the positive feedback. Uh, but nonetheless, it's very expensive to have these instructors there. Um, they're often hard to find because they'd rather be on the boats. And also they get really cranky. You know, nobody wants to see a student screw up a turn 50 times over. They'd rather be somewhere else. So the goal here is to develop an intelligent tutor, a software-based tutor that can monitor what the student's doing and give feedback so, an instruct so you can have one instructor for eight students instead of one instructor for one student. So Stanford University is developing the intelligent tutor. Uh, so that's actually why the main purpose I'm here for the week is working with the people at Stanford. Uh, but the Navy is developing essentially what I like to call the answer key. So the student's doing something and the tutor's monitoring what the student's doing if the tutor doesn't know what the right answer is or what an expert would be doing, it's not able to give feedback properly. So at the Navy, what I'm working on is, working, is understanding what an expert would do. So we actually went across the street to the Surface Warfare Officer School. For anonymity purposes, that's why that guy's face is blurred out. Um, but we got them into the system and we said, hey, can you dock a ship? Can you undock a ship? And you can... And then we could ask them, pepper them with questions. Why did you do this? Why did you make the turn? Why were you going this fast? How did you know when to stop? And we interviewed, we videotaped, and got all this information. We read a bunch of books, and we work on distilling this into something that works essentially like a flowchart. In this case here, it's kind of a text base. It's a text flowchart of, well, they have the goal to do this, which means they develop this sub-goal. If this, you know, if they haven't hit the threshold they're looking, excuse me, if they haven't hit the threshold they're looking for, keep monitoring. If they have, then move on to the next goal, things like that. But it's essentially breaking the task down into its primary cognitive pieces and then laying those out so that it's easy to understand. And then from there, we can take that and actually implement it in what's called the cognitive architecture, which is a piece of software. So you can actually click on go and the software will go through similar steps and make decisions and solve problems in a similar way. And from this piece of software, the intelligent tutor can pull out information about what an expert would be doing. Okay, so finally, last thing, and then I'm done, is the idea of training higher level cognition, problem solving and decision making skills. And really, one of the best ways to do that, I think, is to make sure that the people you're trying to train have a full, as a best of an understanding of the problem at hand that they can possibly have, without going all the way down to you know, atoms and chemistry and things like that. But in the upper left, you see a sonar display. I've actually showed an example of that earlier. Um, okay. Um, it's all this sonar sound data coming in. And the interesting thing about this is that if you have a certain sound ping coming in, you don't necessarily know what that means for where the target is in the environment. The target could be at 3,000 yards away at this angle, or it could be 2,500 yards away at this angle. It's, it's not exactly a perfect science of figuring out because of the sound I'm getting back, this target is here. So you have to end up trying a bunch of different solutions. Well, what about this one, and this one, and this one, and this one? And each of those solutions have a better goodness of fit, or have more error or less error. And that's displayed on a display that looks like one of these four, known as a PEP display, parameter evaluation plot. Um, on the x-axis here is actually time. So you can see with not a lot of data, you get a display that's all red. In this case, red is actually good, which is probably backwards based on from the very beginning. 
but red means very little error. The solution fits very well, so it's very likely that the target is over here. So without much data, what this is saying is, oh, the target could be anywhere, which is not very helpful if you want to actually fire a torpedo. However, with more time, you get more information, and by 20 minutes, you've gotten lots of data, and you can see the little, the red piece is a very small function of that. So this is the kind of display that these fire control technicians are working with, but they only pretty much read it in a book. They might have a classroom lecture explaining it, but it's not very good. We want to make sure they really understand it. So what we've actually done, this is built, believe it or not, in Second Life. Uh, that virtual world technology that nobody uses anymore, well, surprise, the government's still using it. Um, but they've actually, it's essentially, they're not using it to chat with other people, but they're using it kind of as um, a modeling and simulation platform that's been built by someone else, in this case, Linden Labs. So we're just leveraging that technology. Um, but they built a 3D PEP, because what actually happens is that the color, as I said, represents more or less error. But in this case, you can actually represent it spatially by the height in the z-axis of how much error there is. And there's all kinds of functionality in here. Well, people can click a play button, and it can actually go up top. It'll try each of the different solutions, show you how good the fit is, and actually build individually each of those little boxes. So if you have enough time, if the fire control technician is really curious, they can sit there and play around and see how this graph is actually built square by square to figure out where the best solutions are. So from here, they get a really comprehensive picture of what this PEP display is actually doing, and hopefully this gives them, um, they're able to perform their job much better. So in summary, as a whole, our cognition doesn't always work the way that we want it to. But there are many different ways to understand our cognition, and there are many ways to make our cognition better in terms of training our cognition. So human factors sometimes feels like common sense, but it's not always common sense. But creating usable designs is critical, whether people are searching for something on the web or whether people are trying to localize targets on a submarine. Thanks a lot. Ten minutes for questions. Sure. I'm, anyone has questions, I'm, I'm happy to take them. If not, that's okay. Oh. Thanks for the talk. Um, I, w I was curious about um, a couple points. Uh, sure. Let's do a mashup of a couple points that you mentioned. So the ten dollar, thirty dollar sort of uh, orbital frontal cortex thing, uh, the biases that are created. Yes. Um, in interpreting um, something. So when, uh, how do you actually deal with that when you're designing an interface um, around maybe the, the correctness of the data versus any biases, like even from color, like is, a, is color a bias and will that create someone to have, uh, to misread a result or lay an impression of the result uh, as an interpretation that's more favorable when it may not be? Sure. Absolutely, and it's, and it's definitely something that you have to be aware of. In this case, I would consider it more of a need for designers to really understand the presence of that bias versus trying to train out those biases from people. For example, if something's happening at the neural level, it's going to be very difficult. It's almost like an optical illusion, what's happening at the neural level. So training them, this is really what's happening, might be very difficult. Versus if we're able to understand these biases through things like research and human factors, um, you know, not necessarily reading the literature, but talking to someone who has read the literature, understanding this is how people actually work, and we're going to have to work on designing around that. Something like color is certainly one of those issues that comes up a lot. People are colorblind. People have different associations with color. Um, but there's a lot of, there is a lot of research out there that we're going to have to seek to understand. Oh, there's a question right here. So the uh, attention anti-focus, the distraction from you know, what you ought to be paying attention to, but it's not quite interesting enough. Yes. Um, how do you, are, are there good ways of, of, of trying to keep someone's attention on that, even though it's a boring thing? I mean, it's just, this is like the, you know, the airplane pilot problem of yes. you know, 250 people, and if you screw up, they die, and your job is boring. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that's actually a field, or, um, a field within cognitive psychology known as vigilance, where people have to pay ultra attention to something, um, or baggage screeners at the airport have to, you know, sit there and look at these bags. They get, you know, five, ten seconds to look at them. And you know, how often is there going to be a knife or a gun or anything like that? 
And there's actually been a lot of research on this as well. There are, and the strategies, for example, you know, TSA, baggage screeners get a lot of training. It doesn't really seem to help. Every so often you get a news article saying, you know, someone, you know, was testing and passed through five guns through security and they totally missed them. Um, but there are some strategies, things like giving people lots of breaks. Um, TSA employees get a break fairly often. I want to say maybe every half hour, but don't quote me on that. Um, but breaks, for example, um, and then upping what's called the hit rate. So essentially, because in a, in a task where you're trying to detect something like baggage claim or baggage screening, there's very rarely going to be a gun or a knife in the bag for you to detect. So it's not a very satisfying job. However, if you start inserting image, you know, inserting guns, which they do, um, they'll, they'll put in like an image of a gun. So someone says, you know, oh, there's a gun, but it turns out it's just it's a kind of it's a false thing. But at least they got some satisfaction that hey, they did their job correctly. So if they, so especially if it's their job and it's a really boring task, those are ways to give them incentive to pay attention. If it's something that's not necessarily their job, um, then it might be harder to keep their attention versus them just totally turning away. Okay, I'll put you on the spot. What do you think of the search results page that we have? <laughs> not the home page, the search but results. The search results page. I personally like the search results page. Everything's on, um, it's on the left-hand side. Um, that's definitely putting me on the spot. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll talk to you about it afterwards. <laughs> okay, um, but in general, I tend to like, I think it's relatively uncluttered. Um, things like the ads that are right on top um, are kind of highlighted as these are ads. So you're able to kind of skip past that. And the actual content is, is nicely segregated. So it's really easy, it's really easy to find. Um, the question I did want to ask you is uh, around uh, um, the study that you mentioned where they were using video games for uh, yes. attention and peripheral vision. Um, is it, was it also measuring attention in the sense that experienced players, because um, there's two different types of attention neurologically, so mm -hmm. is it sort of the active or passive attention uh, as well as um, are, they actually, are they actually focusing because I thought maybe novices would focus too hard and not actually see things in their peripheral vision. So it's a matter of being too specific and having to move. Whereas um, if if you don't focus, you actually increase your peripheral vision. So are experienced players just relaxing more and and not moving because they're more relaxed, but then they're actually seeing less detail. Sure, absolutely. And it's actually kind of um, the best way to answer your question is that there was one specific task called the useful field of view where there's um, a central task where they have to discriminate between one item or another, and you can make that very difficult. For example, line orientation from horizontal to like five, 10 degrees off. But then at the same time that the central task is presented, something in the peripheral is, de is in the, something from the periphery is presented that they also have to detect. So it's a matter of the uh, center detection task and the peripheral. And what you find a lot of times is that um, the standard effect, not ignoring expert versus novices, is that the harder the central task is, it's almost like attention gets sucked in, so they're worse at detecting things in the periphery. What you find with experts is that, their atten is that attention doesn't get quite as sucked in. They're still good at the central task, but they're still also able to pay attention in the periphery. So it's almost like if you buy into this theory of attentional resources, we have kind of this pool of how much you can pay attention to. Experts can pay attention to more, both centrally and peripherally as well. Does anyone in VC have a question? Well, following up on his question, this is drifting a little bit. Um, there's, you know, a, a thing that you know, people can get in the zone or, or in, the, in flow. Yes. And I'm wondering if you ever tried to, you know, see how attention changes when someone is in flow. Sure. And that's an excellent question. And I'm not familiar with any research off the top of my head that's actually looked at that. Ricardo, are you familiar with that? Any There's been a lot of research on flow, but. Yeah, I'm not, it's it's certain, it's definitely interesting, um, but I'm not familiar with anything like that. But because I know that one thing that happens is you totally screen out, 
yes. everything that does not yep. your attention is fully is fully focused but, on something. But when you've got you know sort of a central and peripheral tasks, I wonder if can you get in flow with that? Is it is it or is it impossible? Yep. Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah. We typically think of flow as you're focusing on one task very intensely. So in terms of things like alerts that pop up, you might totally ignore them, or the phone rings and you totally ignore it. Uh, but yeah, but I'm not familiar with too many studies with that. One place I might look, um, for example, is the attention deficit disorder literature, where people are, obviously that's a case of, a specific case of, of how attention works. But uh, people with ADD tend to get very focused on one particular task, and it's hard to distract them. So studying, studying that, um, that phenomenon could inform, could inform uh, normal attention. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, what's your perspective on um, level of detail? Because I was at a talk recently, and uh, it surprised me because it was a Tufty talk, and he's very adamant about detail and sure. that um, our throughput in our eyes is like 20 megabytes of data a second, and and he's all for like adding as much detail as possible, so that if you're trying to show data. If it's a graph line, it should be a spark line where, like, if you looked at it really sharply, that your eyes could actually pick up all the very minute sure. differences. And so, when you're trying to present data of an idea, like someone has to be, someone needs a larger version of it to sort of grab their attention. But that once they have their attention, they sort of need the detail. And usually, we we only have one state versus a graduated state. So, do you have any opinions on that? Sure, absolutely. And I think with proper design, it can definitely be done. Um, there are some examples of like fisheye displays. That, um, that might be tied to something like eye tracking. So as you move your eyes, where your eyes are focused, that part becomes almost like zoomed in. So if you have a display, so almost from a zoomed out perspective, you can see where the data is that you want. But as you look at it, that data actually kind of comes into focus. Um, as long as it's, it needs to be designed correctly in such a way that from the zoomed out perspective, which is you know when you're standing back and looking at everything, you know where the data is that you want. Otherwise, if, it's, if you really need to focus on it and you don't know where it is, it's going to be impossible to find. So, that, so you, you have this problem of designing from a zoomed out perspective, but also designing once they've actually walked up to this poster or whatever it is and looked much, or a computer screen and looked much more closely, that they're able to still retain the sense of space of where they are in the entire, the entire thing, but still re, re, um, receive that information kind of right at the center. So it's certainly going to, it makes sense. It's going to be a really tough design challenge. Someone like Tufty, of course, can probably pull that off, but I'm not sure about as, as a standard usage. Thank you. Thank you all.